Well, good morning, everyone. Happy New Year to all of you, and Happy New Year to you who are watching online. I'm a, I just love being here. I wouldn't want to be anywhere else to begin my new year than with you, with God's people, with my brothers and sisters, where we can come and and encourage each other. As I was standing at the front doors this morning, and people were coming in and encouraging me, and we were able to encourage each other, and and I was able to hear what people were reading and in the Word and how they were being encouraged by it. And man, my soul is already excited this morning, and we haven't even started yet. This is so good. Um, I'm glad you're here. Um, you know, one of the questions as we, um, as I give you just a few announcements this morning, I, let me just real quick remind everybody, I'm going to pick on my buddies Jim and Virginia Seraphim back there because I love you guys. You guys haven't picked up your cards yet. Yeah. <laughs> Many of you have not picked up your cards yet, and if you don't pick them up today, I'm going to go through them and find any cash that's in them and keep it for myself, and then I'll leave you your card back. But no, really, go back there and pick up your cards. They're an encouragement, and it's a reminder of, of the people that God has surrounded us with to do life with us and to love us. And so please pick those up in the foyer on your way out of service today. You know, as, a, um, as an elder in the church, one of the questions that we often get asked is, I want to read the Bible, but I don't know where to begin. Where should I begin? What should I be reading? And what process should I be reading it? And our pastor back there thinking about that, who um, we sure are blessed to have the pastor we have, aren't we? Um, we need to be make sure and we're praying for him and reminding him and encouraging him how much we love him and how good he is to us. But he's taken the time to put together a Bible in a year reading plan. This is something that we get asked a lot. So if you look on the foyer outside on the table out there, you'll see we have about 30 of them out there. We can print as many as you need. It's January 1st. It's day one of the year. What a great day to begin a commitment of being in God's word every single day. And uh, he has laid out a list for you so that if you will uh, stay disciplined, and it'll take discipline, but if you'll stay disciplined with that list, on December 31st, you'll have read every word in God's word by the end of the year. Isn't that amazing? And uh, what a blessing that is. Um, I can tell you from experience in my own life, it was, I have never grown more in my faith and in my love for the Lord and my love for my wife and my family and those around me than when I read the Bible in a year. And so I want to encourage you to do the same. Really want to ask you to do that and join with us as we dive through and into the Word. We are blessed to be a part of a church that holds the Word of God as we do, and we esteem it as the ultimate authority because it is God's Word. And so I want to encourage you to join with this. So pick that up on your way out. As we go to the Lord in prayer this morning and as we are we begin our time of service, and as uh, you'll hear many people tell you today, Happy New Year, and you'll say Happy New Year to a lot of people. Today is that day where you'll see a lot of people talk about New Year's resolutions. You know, one of the things that New Year's resolutions does for me is it reminds me of all the ones I didn't hit the prior year, <clears throat> which is most of them. Um, I was thinking about that, and I was thinking about my Heavenly Father this morning, and this verse from Lamentations 3 came to mind. So I want to read it to you as we begin our time of prayer. It's from Lamentations 3, in verse 20, he says, My soul continually, is rem my soul continually remembers it, and it is bowed down within me. But this I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, great is your faithfulness. Great is your faithfulness to, to wretched sinners such as we are. When we would have walked away from ourselves... You would not. You did not. In fact, you grabbed on tighter and you held us closer. Even though we continually fail you day after day after day in worship of ourselves, worship of our own desires, our pride, our lusts, our immoralities, our addictions. Your steadfast love never ceases, and your mercies are new every morning. 
Father, let that be our hope today in this year and every year forevermore. Not in what we can accomplish, but what you have accomplished. What you have already done, for you said it is finished. All of the work necessary for the salvation of man is finished. And so as we begin this time of worship, as we begin this new year, Lord, remind us of your greatness. Let us come and worship you today. Give us hearts of worship, minds of worship. Give us minds to understand that which you will teach us today from your word. Change your people today. Conform us into the image of our Savior. Make us a body of people that would be useful in this world. That we might go out and preach the gospel and live the gospel, care for people. That you might use our good works to bring them to a desire to know your son Jesus. That you might save them. Lord, it's so easy for us to get caught up in all of the things that we need, for we need much. Would you help us to see beyond those things and trust you to care for all of those things and to just be focused on you today? Lord, as we gather here today, there are people here with great sadness. They didn't wake up today and say, Happy New Year. They're mourning. And they need your comfort. And they need your peace. We all need your peace. Lord, would you surround them this morning? Would you hold them close? Would you remind them of your faithfulness? Remind them that your love never ceases. That you have not forgotten them. That you have never been closer to them. Hold them up, Father, by your mighty right hand. And I pray. Lord, we lift up the gifts that will come to you today. This money, these finances, these things that we give to you that you have no need of but that you bless us with as we give them to you, Father. Would you use them in a way that would glorify you and build your kingdom? Would you give the elders wisdom in how to disperse them and how to use them for the building of your kingdom and for your church, Lord? Bless those who give, Father, that they might give more, that they might honor you with all that they have and all that they are. Bless our time of singing this morning, God. Thank you for this praise team that you have blessed us with. These men and women with the talents that you have given them that they so graciously give to us and to serve you with. Would you bless them this morning, Father? Bless our song this morning. May it be pleasing to you. May the words of our mouth be in line with the attitude of our heart. Bring them together. Let us not just sing words, but let us worship you, our King. Let us be aware of nothing but you. Bless our time in your word this morning as your word is open and spoken. Fill this place, Father, with your spirit. Light your people on fire this morning for you. Begin a revival in this place, Father, we pray. Fill this place, Father, with people who love you and will serve you. Fill this place with people who come to know you. Fill this place with disciples, Lord. Thank you for our time this morning, Father. We are so in need of it. And we are so blessed by it. So bless this time. Be pleased. Be honored. Our King, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we'll stand and worship this morning with a semi-familiar one. Joyful, joyful, we adore thee.
2022 and also in 2023 as we go into a new year. Let's sing one.
Good morning, church. I'm glad you made it from your long night out last night. I'm glad you've chosen to work for us this morning. We're going to read from Galatians chapter 1 this morning. Uh, Galatians chapter 1, beginning with verse number 1. Hear the word of the Lord this morning. Paul, an apostle, not from men nor through man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead and all the brothers who are with me to the churches of Galatia, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to deliver us from the present evil age, according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel, Not that there is another one, but there are some who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preach to you, let him be accursed. As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one you received, let him be accursed." For am I now seeking the approval of man or of God? Or am I trying to please man? If I were still trying to please man, I would not be a servant of Christ. For I would have you know, brothers, that the gospel that was preached by me is not man's gospel. For I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it, but I received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ. The word of the Lord this morning. Let's pray. Lord, I'm thankful to you for this gospel that you have given to us. We um, humbly come before you this morning as your people gathered in this place to tell you once again how grateful we are for the gospel and how much we are continually in need of it. And so I pray it may never depart from our minds and from our lips that we may ever lift it high and lift you high as the giver of it. I pray that you would help our understanding of it, that we would be clearer and clearer as we go as to what the gospel is and who you are. May we not get it wrong, Lord. We don't want to get it uh, messed up, so we need your help. We need your help to teach us. Be our teacher this morning is my prayer. Help us to see you more clearly. Help us to start this year with you and leave it with you. And may our faith not ever wane in the middle. Uh, be here, we pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stay with that.
before we sing this last song. New Year's is a time where we make resolutions about what we're going to do, what we're going to bring to the table in our lives at the first of each year. And I think this song does a good job of uh, kind of reminding us the first lines. Nothing of our efforts stand, no legacy survive, unless the Lord does raise the house in vain its builders strive. In short, we need the Lord. We come empty-handed. And it's only by the Lord's love that we can stand before him accepted by his grace. So let's sing this tune. Should nothing of our efforts stand, no legacy survive.
Christ. Lord, let that be the anthem of our year in 2023. May all the glory and honor that we produce in our lives go to you. Lord, all the mistakes of 22, uh, they are past and covered by your blood as we confess them to you, Lord. But we're going into 2023 with that, that verse in mind that, that Greg read this morning, Lord, that your mercies are new every morning. It's a reset for a lot of us on January 1st, but it's a, it's a reset each and every morning that we wake up. When we fail the night prior and we sin and we struggle and we have our addictions and our shortcomings, Lord. No matter what day of the year it is, Lord, your mercies are new every morning. Your mercies are new this January 1st. What a, what a great way to start the year in your house, worshiping you, thanking you for what you've done in the past and looking forward to what you'll do in the future. Lord, may your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, in this church, and in our lives. Be with us as we look at your word this morning and open our eyes by your Holy Spirit to see wonderful things in your word. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Amen. Just a pro tip regarding those New Year's resolutions. I have found that it's much easier to succeed at them and to carry them out if you'll start, if you'll wait to start until about mid-December. Uh, it's easier. <laughs> Procrastinate is the word of the day. Today is January 1st. Um, that means uh, we've made another trip around the sun. The earth orbits the sun uh, in a counterclockwise direction, about 93 million miles away from the sun, I'm told. And it takes about 365.256 days to make the trip. Um, that trip is about 584 million miles, which puts us going roughly at a speed of about 67,000 miles per hour, or 19 miles per second, if you prefer. That's pretty fast. Um, as to how many times the Earth has made that journey around the sun, uh, nobody knows for sure. Um, but one thing is for sure, it's made it another time around. And so we will begin this time around the sun studying the book of Galatians on Sunday morning. And I want to just uh, introduce the book to you this morning, and then we'll dig into the text beginning uh, next week. Galatians is a book that has been identified over the course of church history as a number of things. Uh, it's been called the Magna Carta of Christian Freedom. If you don't know what the Magna Carta is, that doesn't help you very much. Um, but rather than stop to teach you the history of the Magna Carta, written in 1215 is what we'll say about it, um, I'll just tell you that the Magna Carta was the template for our Declaration of Independence and our Constitution of the United States. And the connection is that Galatians shows us what freedom in Christ looks like. The word freedom, or maybe liberty, is mentioned in Galatians several times, and it's a recurring theme throughout the book. But if I were to say to you this morning something along the lines of, in our day and age, we need to be very watchful and concerned about our freedom, your mind would probably go towards the thinking of the government perhaps coming to take away our freedoms. Now, personally, I would say you might be right about that, and that's something we should be very wary of, but there's a more important freedom that Galatians is talking about than the freedom we have as U.S. citizens. There's something of eternal consequence, a freedom that impacts a lot more than our rights to fill in the blank, right to free speech, right to bear arms, right to whatever is your pet thing. There's a more important freedom than that, not equally as important as our freedom that we have as Americans, but far more important than our freedom that we have as Americans. Now, so you might wrestle with that, but it is that freedom that Galatians is talking about, 
And that should be of great interest to us all who are at least Christians. Um, in addition to the Magna Carta of the Christian freedom, Galatians has also, um, has also been called the battle cry of the Reformation. It's called this because about 505 trips around the sun ago, a guy by the name of Martin Luther, who was a Catholic monk, launched the Protestant Reformation after studying the book of Galatians. Luther said of this book, this is my epistle. It is as dear to me as my beloved Katie, who was his wife. Luther saw the words in Galatians 3.11, the righteous shall live by faith, and realized what was wrong with the gospel that the Roman Catholic Church had been preaching, and he began to understand the true gospel. Luther, prior to seeing that phrase, the righteous shall live by faith, was a very troubled and confused man. He thought of himself as a complete and utter failure. He had fallen into deep depression, was living in complete fear about whether or not he was good enough for God. On one occasion when he was still studying to be a lawyer, he was out in a field during a storm and a lightning bolt hit very uh, very near to him, and it terrified him to the degree that in that moment he committed himself to become a monk, thinking that maybe the next lightning bolt might kill him if he didn't do that. But in the, um, in the monastery where he went, he found the road to salvation to be increasingly harder in fact, it was so hard that the Roman Catholic Church had invented a place called purgatory, and the purpose of purgatory was to purge, that's where we get the word purgatory from, was to purge the remaining sins of the people who were too bad for heaven, but too good for hell. And it turns out there was a lot of people in that category, too bad for heaven and too good for hell, who seemed to need purging. So they had this place called purgatory, the place of purging. Luther felt like the best that he could ever hope for was purgatory because no matter what he did, he never got over the reality of his own sinfulness. He was tortured on the inside by guilt and fear. Monks so feared God and the wrath of God that they then turned to Mary, in the hope that she might be kinder and more compassionate. And they would go to her and plead with her to plead with Jesus to God on their behalf in hopes that God might grant them salvation. Luther was terrified of God and Jesus, and he was taught that salvation is by grace, but that you have to earn that grace. That's ironic, isn't it? In other words, you have to reach a certain point of worthiness. You have to accumulate a certain amount of merit if you're going to be worthy enough, then God might give you that grace. So in order to become worthy, Luther went to the extremes. He gave himself over to every conceivable kind of severe discipline. He was told that food, if it was meager, would be a way that he could earn some sort of merit with God. And so he and the other monks gave themselves to a diet of bread and water only. They were told that if they struggled with uncomfortable clothing, they put stones in their shoes. They could accumulate some kind of worthiness for themselves. And he would deprive himself of sleep at one point he was fasting so often that his friends were afraid he was going to die. But he still didn't feel like he had done enough. So he decides to walk to Rome, 800 miles to Rome, so that when he could get to Rome, he, it was there he could ascend something called the Scala Sancta, the holy steps, which were supposed to be the steps that uh, Jesus went up to Pilate's judgment hall on. They were supposedly transported from Jerusalem 
to Rome, and sinners could gain merit if they crawled up those steps on their knees, kissing every step along the way. And so he did that. And by the way, if you think that's only something that happened 500 years ago and not today, as recently as August the 11th, 2015, the Roman church officially offered what they called an apostolic penitentiary, an indulgence of mercy in the afterlife for everyone willing to do the same today. And people still do it today by the thousands. Well, after having done that and walked the 800 miles back to Germany, he was still so burdened by his own sin that he would confess his sins incessantly to his priestly confessor, a man by the name of Staupitz. And Staupitz became so worn out by these long confessions, sometimes up to six hours a day, he got mad and said to him, don't come back unless you commit adultery. Stop with the endless confessions. But he had no peace. What was driving Luther to this level of terror and fear was that he desperately wanted to be made right with God because he understood God and he understood God's wrath and God's judgment and the reality of an eternal punishment in hell. He had great fear of God. Listen, I want to tell you that the fear of God is a necessary truth to drive sinners to seek reconciliation from God. Where there is no fear of God, there is no salvation. Paul says in Romans chapter 3, that great salvation chapter of sinners, there is no fear of God in their eyes. Luther had that part right. He wanted God to forgive him and to accept him. He wanted to escape hell. He wanted to enter heaven. But even as a monk in a monastery, doing everything he could possibly do, he could not find relief from his fear and his guilt. Here's what he said, quote, I tortured myself with praying, fasting, keeping vigils, and freezing. The cold was enough to kill me. I inflicted such pain as I would never inflict again, but found no peace and no rest, unquote. He was doing everything he could, and God seemingly wasn't responding. In fact, Luther was convinced, he became convinced that it was impossible for any sinner to satisfy God and be accepted by God. And so he began to feel that God was in fact cruel. And he actually came to hate God. Let me read you what he wrote. Quote, I did not love, yes, I hated the righteous God who punishes sinners. I raged against God with fierce and troubled conscience. It's clear that he had no clue how to be right with God. There's a character in the Bible who had similar thoughts and questions about God, and his name was Job. And Job has the same question Martin Luther had. Job chapter 9, Job asked, but how can a man be in the right before God? That was Luther's question, that was Job's question, and that's the question... That question on your screen right now, that's the question that every religion in the world attempts to answer. All religions assume a deity, and all religions assume a means by which you can pacify that deity and move from being harmed by him or her or them and being blessed by that God. That's what religion is. All religions offer an answer to the question, how can a man be made right before God. And all religions, except the true gospel of Jesus Christ, give the wrong answer. Job, you'll remember, was a good man. In fact, the book of Job starts this way, Job 1.1, there was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job, and that man was blameless and upright, one who feared God and turned away from evil. That's a good guy. Sounds like Martin Luther. Job's as good as it gets. Why is he asking the question, how can a man be made right by God, with God? Because a man, an upright man, a blameless man, a man who avoids evil, how can a man be that good and not be right with God? Answer, 
because being a good man doesn't make you right with God. Really because you can't be good enough. Job needed to understand that. Here's Job then, this good man, blameless man, righteous man. He has all of his children die. He loses everything he has. He loses his health. He becomes a physical wreck. And he's saying, God, I'm doing my best. I'm doing the best I can. What's happening here? What's causing this? I don't know what to do. Let me just read to you a paraphrase of his words to God. Here's what he says. Listen to this paraphrase. I hate my life and don't want to go on living. Oh, God, leave me alone for my few remaining days. What are people that you should make so much of us, that you should think of us so often? For you examine us every morning and test us every moment. Why won't you leave me alone? If I have sinned, what have I done to you, O watcher of all humanity? Why make me your target? Am I a burden to you? Why not just forgive my sin and take away my guilt? For soon I will lie down in the dust and die. That what you're hearing there is profound confusion and hurt, agony, very much like Martin Luther. Then in the next chapter, that was Job chapter 7, in the next chapter, Job has a friend, a quote-unquote friend. Turns out he's a useless friend. But he comes to give Job advice, and here's what he says. He gives the answer to Job that all religion gives. Listen to his answer. How long will you go on like this, Job? You sound like a blustering wind. Does God twist justice? Does the Almighty twist what's right? Your children must have sinned against him. So their punishment was well-deserved. That's not like a nice guy, right? All your children die. It must be their fault. But if you pray to God, Job, and seek the favor of the Almighty, and if you are pure and live with integrity, God will surely rise up and restore your happy home. And though you started with little, you'll end with much. But look, God will not reject a person of integrity. He will once again fill your mouth with laughter and your lips with shouts of joy. That's the answer of all religion. Be good to God, and God will be good to you. Or be good to the gods, and the gods will be good to you. Or be good to karma, and karma will be good to you. However, your religion, our religion, defines good. All that will be done as long as you're good to whatever God you have. After my, after my brother-in-law passed last year, my sister had a lady come up to her in her church and say to her that if David, her husband, if David had had more faith, he would not have died from cancer. That's what she told him. That's what she told her. Last week I heard Joel Osteen say the same thing Job's friend said. If you live right, God will make you happy and fill your mouth with laughter and your lips with shouts of joy. So it's after all this false religion kind of talk that Job's friend tells him that that's when Job asked the question in Job chapter 9, because basically he's saying, but I have been good. I have been faithful. What am I missing here? How can a man be right with God? Here's the psalmist's conclusions to that question. Psalm 130, if you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? In other words, if you're counting sins, there isn't anybody who's going to stand up against that. Psalm 143, enter not into judgment with your servant, for no one living is righteous before you. Nobody living. Maybe you're not supposed to speak ill of the dead, so we'll just restrict it to the land of the living. Nobody living. Here's the prophet's conclusion on it. Isaiah 64, we have all become like one who is unclean, and all our righteous deeds are like a polluted garment. We all fade like a leaf, and our iniquities like the wind take us away. There is no one who calls upon your name 
who rouses himself to take hold of you, for you have hidden your face from us and have made us melt in the hand of our iniquities. That doesn't sound very optimistic at all, does it? Certainly no way to start a new year. Micah the prophet, Micah chapter 6, how can I be righteous before God? With what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before God on high? Shall I come before Him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams and with ten thousands of rivers of oil? Like, what do I have to give? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression? The fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? In other words, shall I burn my babies in the fire like the worshipers of Molech do? Would that be enough, Lord, to satisfy you? How can I be righteous before God? That's the pleading cry of the psalmist and the prophets and Job and Martin Luther. How can I escape guilt? How can I escape death? How can I escape hell? How can I receive eternal life? And heaven. And all religion gives the wrong answer. Be good. Be better. I'm here to tell you, it doesn't work. And then one day, Martin Luther's boss assigns him to teach the younger monks the book of Galatians. And he discovers in its pages the gospel of Jesus Christ that the righteous shall live by faith. He discovers that there's only two possible options to acceptance to God. There is what Jesus calls the narrow way and the broad way. Both ways say they lead to heaven, but both don't go there. The narrow way, the way of the gospel, the way of grace, the way of faith leads to life. The broad way, the way of religion, the way of works, it says heaven but goes directly to hell. Now, to say that the gospel of Jesus Christ is the only way to salvation, to say what Paul says in Galatians chapter 1 and verse 8, which we read, that if anybody preaches another gospel, let him be accursed, let him be damned forever, God damn him, is what he's saying. If anybody preaches a different one than that, to speak in that kind of narrow language is not a popular way to speak today. It's not very winsome. Even the Roman Catholic Church doesn't like that. They've developed what they call natural theology. They say people without the Scripture, without the Gospel, without any knowledge of Christ will show up in heaven, in fact, one day. They will be reconciled to God. They will be forgiven and given eternal life. So if you're poor and humble and without the Bible, without the Gospel, you're going to be in the kingdom of God. It's what they call natural theology. Some Protestants come along and they have another idea that they're now calling wider mercy. They say that God's mercy is wider than just Christianity, wider than just the gospel. A major proponent of this is a guy by the name of Rob Bell, and Rob Bell writes, quote, God has more going on by way of redemption than what happened in first century Palestine. In other words, Rob Bell wants us to believe that God saves through all different kinds of religions. So you see, in Catholicism, you've got this natural thing theology idea, and in some areas of Protestantism, this wider mercy idea that God's salvation is not limited to just the gospel. And even in evangelicalism, where we would put ourselves, there's now what's being called a new perspective on Paul. Theologian N.T. Wright, in his book on the resurrection, says, quote, no one will be justified until he reaches heaven. Quote, I must stress again that the doctrine of justification by faith is not what Paul means by the gospel. The gospel is not an account of how people get saved, unquote. Did you hear that? The gospel is not an account of how people get saved. Well, really? Because here's Paul in 1 Corinthians 15. Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved. 
Conclusion, N.T. right is N.T. wrong. It's wrong. And look, look, people who name the name of Christ from all church backgrounds are falling for this kind of stuff, and it's a false gospel. The good news about Martin Luther was that the Spirit was at work in his soul, and it was the knowledge of the revelation of God as a righteous judge and the wrath of God from the Scriptures that he reads in this book, which activates his soul to cause him to fear until he can find the truth. Luther had been exposed to the wrath of God on the pages of Scripture, but he now reads in Galatians 3.11 that the righteous shall live by faith, and the light dawns on him, and he realizes that salvation is not by works. It's not by merit. It's not by climbing those stairs in Rome. It's by grace through faith alone, and that the righteous lives by faith, and that the righteousness of God is imputed to the believer. And if you don't know what the word imputed means, we'll get there. And when the gospel shines through on Luther's heart, and the Holy Spirit gives him life, it comes with it peace and joy, and all that floods him, and he was forgiven and accepted and reconciled and converted solely by grace through faith. And he writes this quote, listen to this quote, through faith in Christ, therefore Christ's righteousness, whose righteousness? Not mine. Christ's righteousness becomes our own righteousness. And all that he has becomes ours. Rather, he himself becomes ours. He who trusts in Christ exists in Christ. He is one with Christ, the same as he. Galatians 2.20, I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. Look. The issue of the gospel was not settled 505 years ago. It was settled 2,000 years ago, settled in the book of Galatians and Romans and the rest of the New Testament. It was settled, and it was clear that salvation, as the Apostle Paul describes it, here's how Paul describes it, Romans chapter 3, look at this, but now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law like apart from works. Although the law and the prophets bear witness to it, Paul says, the righteousness of God, look at it, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who climb the stairs. Is that what it says? No. For all who believe. For all who believe. How can a man be right with God? by the righteousness of God being given to him or her through faith in Christ. It's becoming more and more clear to me that more and more people struggle with this. I'm talking about people within the church, more than I had originally thought. This year, we had someone leave our church over this very issue, not understanding the gospel, not believing that it is by faith alone. He thought he had to do more, that we must make ourselves worthy to get this grace of God. But as we study this book in the coming weeks, we're going to discover that that aspect of the gospel, that faith alone aspect of the gospel, is a non-negotiable. How non-negotiable is it? I'll just show you. Verses 6, 7, and 8. <coughs> Pardon me, verse 6. There it is. I'm astonished that you're so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. Not that there is another one. But there are some who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. Then he says this, even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preach to you, let him be cursed. He says that twice. This is kind of frightening. <coughs> Whatever form of corrupted gospel, the gospel of works, the prosperity gospel, the gospel of 
natural theology, the gospel of wider mercy, the new perspective on Paul, whatever you want to call it. Another gospel is a distorted gospel, and even if an angel were to appear in this building right now to come tell you about it, you ought to go, that's a lie. And the one who teaches it is cursed, and the one who believes it is apparently cursed as well. And that's frightening. Should be frightening. Now, I'm going to make a bold prediction for 2023. Okay, our... I'm not going to tell you who's going to win the Super Bowl. I'm going to tell you something much more important. A bold prediction, okay? Here it is. The earth is going to go around the sun again in the next roughly 365.256 days. That's a bold prediction. It's not so bold, is it? You all know that's going to happen. What I can't predict is whether or not you'll make it all the way around again. there's a fairly good possibility, even in a crowd this size, that someone within the sound of my voice today won't make it around again. 60 plus people died this week in a storm in New York, in a blizzard. And we're not going to have a blizzard. But you understand what I'm saying. 365.256 days is enough time for you not to make it all the way around. And if you're not concerned about the wrath of God that awaits, it's for maybe one of a couple of reasons. It's either because you know that you've been given God's righteousness and don't have to be concerned with the wrath of God because you're as righteous as Jesus is by faith in Jesus. Does that make sense? You're as righteous as Jesus is because you have faith in Jesus' righteousness. God's given you His righteousness. So there's no need to be concerned about the wrath of God because it doesn't concern you. Or perhaps you're not concerned about the wrath of God because you believe a gospel that's not true, in which case you'll be cursed. Now, it's important that we get it right. Do you all understand how important the book of Galatians might be? Yeah. It's important we get it right. And you might say, well, preacher, that's not a very encouraging way to begin the new year. To which I say to you, no, no, it is, it is. It is because God's gospel, the true gospel of Jesus Christ, while it condemns everyone trying to get there another way, it offers a way to anyone who calls upon the name of the Lord. Anyone who calls upon the name of the Lord, I want to make sure you hear my word, anyone who calls upon the name of the Lord to save them, God will save them. In other words, it's an offer of free grace to any who believe, without exception. Put your faith in the God who saves. Ask Him for His grace. Ask Him for His righteousness. You don't have to be worthy enough to accept it. In fact, if you think you are worthy enough to accept it, you're not getting it. You don't have to be worthy enough to accept it. You just accept it. Okay, God, you're, you're offering me grace. You're offering me your righteousness. Anyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Are we clear on that? Are you sure? <laughs> well, that's what the book of Galatians is about. So we're going to dig into it. And I pray, I pray that if, you don't, if you're still confused about all this, that you won't leave the building today without coming to talk to me because I'm happy to talk to you about it further. If you're not willing to do that, you've got to come back next week and the week after and the week after and the week after. Okay? Amen? Pray with me. Lord Jesus, we love you and we thank you for your gospel of grace that you've given it to anyone who calls. Anyone who calls on the name of the Lord should be saved without exception. Anyone who calls on you, Lord. And so I pray today, those people listening to me, wherever they may be, in the building or out, that they would take a moment of their time, time that's fleeting. We know not how much time we have left. That they would take the time right now to call upon your name that they would repent of their sins and that they would ask you to save them by your grace, that they would believe what you have said because you've said it over and over and over again. Anyone who calls me, I'll save them. 
faith, even a little bit of faith, even faith the size of a grain of a mustard seed will save. Just a little bit of faith, not full understanding, not full comprehension, just enough faith to ask, God, save me. And you promised you would. So I pray right now that you would convict people of their sin and that you would do a work in their heart that you have to do. Give them the faith to believe this, I pray. Faith's a gift. And so, Lord, I pray that you would give them that gift, that they would hear it and that they would receive it and that they would be saved in this moment, I pray. And I know, Lord, there are many among us who have loved ones that don't believe that. They don't have the faith. And so I pray right now with them that you would do a work in their life and save them, that they would come to believe this, that they would come to exercise faith. Lord, may they feel the weight of their sin. May they feel the impending wrath of God. Even now, as I pray, may they feel the guilt. May they feel the fear and seek you out so you might save them from it. We know that you will. We know that you can. We have faith in you, Lord. We lift you up. And so we ask, Lord, that you do a work among us, among our loved ones who don't know you. May we grab a hold of this gospel clearly. May we understand it more clearly. May we understand you more clearly. May we be with Martin Luther. May we be with Job. May we be with the prophets and the psalmists and all the apostles in the New Testament who finally got it by your grace. May we stand in a company with them and shout praises to your name for all that you've done for us. May we be a joyful people in your grace and love, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together. We'll sing.
relish in that truth this morning, that you're good and that you're gracious. Nothing that we can do to earn your, your righteousness or salvation, but Lord, we come empty-handed and simply cling to the cross that you've offered to each and every one of us here. Be with us as we go, that we would go and give that message to others this week and this year. That we uh, place a special emphasis on, on telling others about you in our lives this year. That you would grow your kingdom and use us mm -hmm. to do it. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you, church. You